my name is Martin Rama. I arrived in Hanoi for the first time in 1998. For a couple of weeks I was in Vietnam, fell in love with Hanoi. Uh, and in 2002 I moved here uh, and that's the time when I took photographs and I uh, decided to write this book. And this book is very much in the spirit of something that is very Hanoian, which is for that is delicious, it has many different ingredients and sometimes it becomes difficult to disentangle one ingredient from the other, you just know the taste. And I thought that was a nice analogy for Hanoi. And I wrote the book in that spirit, like going one ingredient after another uh, of Hanoi. Bước xuống phố sang tinh mơ Dạo qua góc công viên Có bao điều người người chờ Hello and welcome to Expat Living. I'm going to be your host for this episode. You have just met with the author of this book, Hanoi Praminard, and you can probably tell that he's going to be the feature character in this episode. In this book, he said that Hanoi is like a bowl of pho noodle, and his book is built on pho analogy. He said that the 24 chapter of this book are similar to the 24 ingredients that make up a steamy and delicious bowl of pho noodle. How so? Well, let's find out more first about this book. Hanoi Praminard was first published in Vietnam in March this year. The book contains 24 chapters and hundreds of photos taken over the course of a decade by Martin Rama in an attempt to depict the characters that make Hanoi exceptional. The author allows readers of any nationality to soak up the images and thoughts from different perspectives around the city. For foreigners who fall under her charm but find it difficult to explain why, this book can help. I had the pleasure of living in Hanoi twice for a total of seven years. And I think the photos is such, they are such a beautiful reflection of Hanoi, of its special peculiarities uh, from the very special things of Hanoi. But it, I think the, also, the photos also show that it's a city undergoing rapid transition. And uh, I think Martin's efforts to try to preserve Hanoi is very important and, and uh, commendable. Hanoi Promenade is now available in both English and Vietnamese. Translator Nguyễn Văn Tung, a friend of Martin, is the one who has helped bring the book closer to Vietnamese readers. By translating this book, Tung has learned a lot of interesting information about the city where he is living. I like the chapter called Chaos, and when I translate it, I find that it is a kind of the condition for people who who wa want to understand the city and who, who really uh, want to like the city, need to overcome. Like you look, you look at the city and see uh, so many chaos everywhere, but you need to see through it. Hanoians themselves, in spite of their shared love for the city, would be hard-pressed to tell what exactly makes her so special. The book also helps the locals look at their city in a new light. <laughs> Going around on a motorbike is actually an integral part of the Vietnamese love experience, much the same as dating in a car was for generations of Americans. Almost anything can be done on it by Hanoians, even sleeping. And traffic is so dense that young couples manage to let their affection loose on their motorbikes and still enjoy some dose of anonymity. Rich vocabulary, hilarious riding styles, informative images and rare photos of Hanoi as well as Hanoian dating back to a decade ago. Hanoi Promenade must be created by a journalist or a fiction writer but no, one thing you should know, Martin Ramar is an economist and he's renowned for many of his in-depth research reports on economics policy, economic reforms, as well as poverty reduction in many countries. Martin Ramar is now the chief economist for the South Asia region of the World Bank, based in Delhi, India. He and his team actively engage with counterparts in government, academia, civil society, and the business community. 
today, but I want to ask Martin here, because Vietnam is a country which actually did manage to stay on the agricultural base. It also got into manufacturing and grow up, and it is one of your models. A good example was Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam uh, in the mid-1980s was, uh, by the statistics we had, it was one of the five poorest countries on earth. Uh, and some 10, 15 years later, it was the second world exporter of rice after Thailand, the second world exporter of coffee, the first exporter of cashew, nuts, and black pepper and shrimp. And so the question is, how did they manage to do that? From 2002 to 2010, Martin was the World Bank's lead economist for Vietnam based in Hanoi. Between 2007 and 2009, he also served as the acting country director for the World Bank in Vietnam. In this capacity, he oversaw the World Bank program in the country in areas related to economic policy and poverty reduction. He was also the focal person in the policy dialogue with the government in relation to economic reforms and led a series of annual policy lending operations co-financed by a dozen of donors. Beside piles of documents, report and research on economic issues, Martin Ramos has spent a huge amount of time walking through the city, taking thousands of photos of her and read anything he could find about her. Am I correct, Martin? Absolutely. So having written a lot of uh, books and research and report on economic things, so what's the difference this time writing Hanoi Promenade? Well, as you said, I have written tons of reports. That's my job. Uh, I have only written this one book, which is not in that style. And there are similarities and there are differences. I think the, the biggest similarity is you have to be very clear. Uh, the part that is different is that in this book there is quite a lot of emotion, of personal reflection that you don't put when you work on economics. You try to be as factual, uh, close to credible as hypotheses and interpretations of things. Uh, here you can uh, let yourself go much more uh, into a personal reflection. So does the way of uh, writing economic things affect your writing style uh, in Hanoi Promenade? I could not tell. I honestly could not tell. I think it's the same person. I think someone who knows me reading something I wrote in economics can recognize it's me, the same as certainly in the, in the book Hanoi Promenade, but uh, uh, something very logic and very structured about economics that in a way also translates into when, when you look at this book, while it's a book a, about a relationship with a city, about the emotion about the city, uh, it's also very structured. So I suppose that I was influenced by my work in economics. So tell me what have inspired you to uh, write this book and how long did it take you to finish it? I fell in love with Hanoi many years ago, but I didn't have the intention of writing a book. It was more knowing the city, taking advantage of weekends to go around to, to know the city and, and taking pictures, but very amateurish pictures. I'm not a professional photographer. Just, it was just for myself to try to capture what I was seeing. And then over time I was into thousands of pictures and starting to thinking what was in common, you know, when you try to classify your yeah. pictures. And then it started emerging to me that uh, there were really common themes uh, in these photographs and that there were stories that could be told. So probably after, uh, I don't know, four or five years living here, uh, the idea of writing the book start, started coming. And, and then I started being more systematic in the gaps. So it took me, what can I say, the writing itself probably took me a year. Each page tries to convey a message, something like a hundred images of Hanoi, and even how images are in each of these pages uh, contain some type of message. That took me a long time, so I would say whatever, two, three years really on the book. Since you have moved to another country to live, do you ever miss Hanoi? Oh, of course, yeah, of course, but I keep coming back. Um, I'm now based in India, or between India and the United States. I go back and forth quite a lot. Um, and of course, I very much enjoy being in India. It's a fascinating place, but I miss Hanoi. So what do you miss most? about her? Um, I always enjoyed life in the streets. You know? Life I, in the street. Yeah, I, I enjoy the fact that public spaces are spaces where people do things, not just go through them, but they do things. They eat, they whatever, work, everything, they, on, the yeah, everything on the street. 
So what do you think if we take a promenade around Hanoi right now? Oh, I'll be delighted about it. Okay, so let's start here. Mm, chaos. Hanoi's 7 million people offers a great picture of so many lives. The city's average population density is estimated at eight times higher than the country's as a whole. For most foreign visitors, the first image of Hanoi is one of chaos, absolute chaos. This idea that you arrive in a city and uh, it's a bit shocking, it's very messy in some ways. And then you start understanding the logic in that mess and even being captivated by the logic in that mess. This is not too far from home, so this is a kind of place to buy uh, fruit and vegetables. So you've been here many times before? Many times, yeah. Mm. And Chohom, the market nearby, mm -hmm. also the street all around Chohom is a good place. So, what do you cook with them? Uh, well, this is uh, regarded as a specialty of Hanoi. Uh, this kind of tree, Konso, can only be grown here in Hanoi. It's uh, used for cooking soup for the summer meal. It's really suitable for summer meal. And then it's, it makes a great juice, Nuk So. Most foreign visitors can soon realize that this chaos is actually governed by Sado, but widely shared rules. And once those rules are understood, making sense of it all becomes easy. Water is part of Hanoi's landscape. Water-shaped language too, Hanoi actually means in the bend of the river or a river runs through it. Together with enormous rivers, intimate lakes pop up at the turn of a street or the end of an alley. With the hobby of wandering around the city, Martin discovered for himself several places like this by chance. So tell me, have you ever get lost during your wandering around Hanoi? I often get lost because, in fact, I'm not going with a particular destination. I'm going in a direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will go in this direction. I will try to find the lake. This lake. I, every time I try to find it, I lose my way because there are these little streets that go around. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting lost is part of the promenade. It's part of the charm. Haiba Lake in Haiba Chung District is like a little gem encircled by quiet streets, walkways, trees, and a pagoda. Activities around them are tranquil. Thousands of crumbling houses throughout Hanoi tell how dominant the Boza style was at the turn of the 20th century. The architecture style was developed in Paris some 300 years ago. Those Boza houses are part of the charm of the city. For Martin, going for a walk through the quiet Hoi Phu street is enough to be convinced. By the time Martin moved to Hanoi 12 years ago, there were about 120 French mansions in Hanoi managed by the Ministries of Foreign Affairs. And he managed to rent one of those mansions and renovate it into the way he always wanted. And this building, which is now the Gata Embassy, was where Martin and his family lived over the course of eight years. The house was originally designed and constructed by a French architect in 1932. The people at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs were very nice. They gave me drawings uh, made by architects from the house. 
So I, with carpenters, we reconstructed that staircase the way it was originally. It looks extremely nice. I believe that you are not the only one to renovate this house to help you. Oh, I did with Tian. No, no, of course. So I asked in my office where they could help me identify an architect or someone who would speak English or French and could help me. And that's how I met uh, Tian, who is by now a friend. Uh, and uh, he really understood what I wanted. So what do you think if uh, we visit him now? Uh, sure. Yeah, to talk more about your house, your sure. own house. Sure, sure. Let's go. Yeah, let's do let's that. Go. Yeah. Meet Nguyễn Đăng Tiến, a construction engineer. He was the one to help Martin renovate his old house on Trần Hưng Đạo Street in 2003. Together, they researched and agreed they would try and restore the mansion back to its original look nearly a century ago. After four months of renovation, they have become good friends who share the same interest in architecture. Về nguyên tắc của cái việc mà sửa những ngôi nhà cổ là phải tôn trọng những cái giá trị là đã có rồi. Như bạn biết đó, một cái ngôi nhà có giá trị là nó có thấm đẫm cái màu thời gian. Cái đấy rất quan trọng. Tại vì chúng ta nếu không hình dung ra mà cố áp đặt một cái gì đó thì tôi rất khó và để tìm tòi để làm sao ứng xử thì rất may rằng hồi đó thì vẫn còn những cái người nhà cung cấp thì họ vẫn còn làm thì bọn tôi cũng rất may mắn là vẫn giữ được và tìm được nhà cung cấp như vậy. This is the second renovation project that marked the successful cooperation between Tien and Martin, as well as Tien's business startup. Located on Nam Chang Street near the West Lake, this house was built in 1931. Mr. Nguyễn Phong Phu, 77 years old, is the owner of this house. He asked Tien to renovate his house, and Martin was the one to lend Tien money to undertake this project. The house underwent six months of renovation by the end of 2003. <coughs> Mr. Fu is pleased to have his house refurbished and extended. His favorite parts of the house are this little backyard and the skylight, which are in typical style of Hanoi Old Quarter houses. Mansions dated back to a century ago. Architectural designs, lakes and rivers, street life are the elements that describe Hanoi in the eye of Martin, who always regards the city as a woman with both good and bad characters. <laughs> Martin said he has read everything he could find about this woman in the hope of knowing her and understanding her better than those who came before him or even after him. And Hanoi Promenade is his attempt to capture just one tiny decade in the life of the city at the very end of its first millennium. So Martin, I have to admit that uh, I was born in Hanoi and have been living in the city for nearly 30 years now, but there's so many things about Hanoi that I do not know until today. So I really want to say thank you to you and your book for providing me as well as the audiences a lot of uh, interesting story about the capital city. And uh, once again, thank you so much for the lovely promenade around Hanoi and I do look forward to your upcoming project. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed working with you to places I really love and I'm really grateful for your interest in my book and my project about Hanoi. Thank you very much. 
And now back to you, moving on to the next part of Expat Living. We're going to leave Hanoi behind and continue to travel to one of the most beautiful beaches in the South Central region of Vietnam with our reporter Lan Eng. So let's see what she has for you in this segment of Time Out. Stressed 20 kilometers along the sea, Nha Chiang Bay features fascinating beaches and islands that are considered a water sport paradise. More and more options are now available for those who fancy a bit of excitement on the beach breaks. Hello, welcome to Time Out. If you're a sport enthusiast visiting Nha Chiang, you will not miss the chance to indulge yourself in the exciting water sports here. And that is exactly what we're doing today. And according me today is my friend Tim from a trailer. He's been working in the water sport industry for the last 30 years. Thanks, Lana. Thanks for having me on the show. Well, welcome to the beautiful Nha Chiang. So we're here for a fun-filled day today. We're going to go through and show you all about jet skiing, parasailing and scuba diving. Are you ready to have some fun? I'm so ready. Let's All go. Right. All right, let's go. If you have tried riding a scooter on land, why not try it on water? Jet skiing is in fact one of the most popular water sports in Nha Chiang. As to many, it is among the easiest. But for beginners like me, proper instructions are always needed beforehand. Well, let me show you the jet ski. So um, here's the seat, and this is where you're going to sit, and these are the handlebars that you use to steer the jet ski. So this here is a throttle, mm -hmm. and we use that to accelerate, and if you let go, you deaccelerate. But importantly, when you turn, you need to make sure that you actually accelerate or go faster than what you were going, because if okay. you don't, then the jet ski will continue we'll going straight. Yeah, yeah. Now also, importantly, you've got a, um, a safety. Now when you fall off, and which you will, um, the safety will pull off the handlebar, and what'll happen, the engine will idle and the, and the jet ski will just circle around you so you can climb back on the back with the handle and you can get back into the seat. And then once you're back on the jet ski, then you just connect that back up there and then you can go. So let's put our life jackets on and let's get on the water. <laughs> Okay, so let me show you one of my other great sports, parasailing. All right. So important thing with parasailing, you've obviously got the parasail. A big this, one. This is a big one. This is the parachute that lifts us up out of the water. Mm -hmm. So as the boat moves along, if it goes fast, uh -huh. we go up. Wow. When the boat slows down, then we go lower to the water. Now, also with parasailing, you've got a harness. So we'll be using the harness, and today we're going to do a tandem. Right, let's get the harness on, and let's get out on the water. All right. Yep. I love the sailing here. We get a really good sea breeze here in the afternoon. We get out there, we go kiting, we get up on one hole and it's absolutely fantastic. Every now and then we fall in, but at the end of the day, we have a great day. I've had a pretty hard landing and accidentally drunk a lot of seawater. But in the end, with the help of team and the staff, I've made it back on the jet skis safe and sound. And the whole experience with the parasailing has been wonderful.
Okay, now we've had some fun in the sky, let's have some fun in the water. What do you think? Let's do it. Okay, great. Well, today, what we're going to do now is some scuba diving. Scuba diving. So, what I want to do is just take, talk you through really quickly some of the things you want to do to make sure it's safe. Firstly, you want to make sure you dive with a reputable dive operator. Always have a dive buddy with you. Let's talk a little bit about the equipment okay. to make sure you feel comfortable when you get in the water. Yeah, I, I see the, there's a lot of them here. Yeah, there's a lot of equipment here and um, please don't break anything yet. We'll okay. <laughs> <laughs> the most eccentric equipment includes a buoyancy compensation device or BCD, which is a streamlined jacket connected via an inflated hose to the air cylinder. A regulator, a demand valve that supplies air whenever the diver wants to breathe via the mouthpiece. Gauge, which tells diver how much air they have and how deep they are under the water. A few other things that are the fins, a weight belt, a mask, a snorkel, a wetsuit. Now when you're in the water, there's a few things you need to do to make sure that people know what's going on. So if you're, if you're okay, it's always using oh. the finger like this and that means okay. This means up. This is not okay, but this so is this, up. That's right. So if you go like that, then oh. everyone else is going to go, oh, you want to go up. If you want your friends to come to you, if you want to show them something, you can tap on the top of your head really? and your friends will come to you. And also, if you want to look at something, you want to point something out, you can just point at your eyes and point at what you're looking at and then they'll know that, hey, look, there's something good to look at. Now that I've shown, taken you through everything, why don't we get into our wetsuits and yeah. get out on the water? Let's go. Okay, let's go. Ugh. Scuba diving here is really good. The water is absolutely incredibly warm. It's all year round, the water is so warm. Um, there's lots of fish, lots of coral, and the equipment's very good too. Train, experience the beautiful diving, get to see an operator and get out here as quick as you can. Thanks for having me on the show, Lena. I had a great time. <laughs> and that's it for this edition of Time Out. I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching, and I see you in the next episode. Goodbye! Goodbye!